As we walked across campus away from my youngest son's dorm room, my wife, Amanda, tried to hold back tears. We had just moved in and Amanda was sniffling, as was our neighbor, Katie, whose boy shared the room with our son. I can't believe our boys are grown up already, our neighbor Katie sighed, taking a napkin from her purse. My wife, Amanda, took one of the napkins. Yes, it's hard to believe, Amanda said, wiping her eyes. Now they have to make so many decisions on their own. I was also thinking about my own important decision. I started to have doubts as we walked to the parking lot. Should I pull the trigger? My plans have been hatched for almost 10 years. Is the timing right? Is it necessary to do this at all? Amanda made a move to squeeze my hand. I dodged it by reaching into my pocket to get my car keys, even though we were still quite a ways from my SUV, and saw our neighbor Katie give me a puzzled look. Mark, it's okay. Amanda spoke. I know what you feel. If only you knew, I thought, returning my thoughts to the past and to the moment from which it all began. I remember Amanda and I had just celebrated our 10th wedding anniversary, and it was also an election year. The swindlers of that time tried to tell us that the other side was even greater thieves and liars. I was wondering when these crooked politicians die. Do you have to dig a hole to bury them? Or are they screwed directly into the ground? After lunch, I picked up the mail and was pleased to see a padded envelope among the junk mail and bills. I won a bunch of SD cards on eBay and the delivery was late. I opened the soft envelope from the back and was horrified to see another smaller pot-bellied manila envelope. Crap, I muttered, opening the enclosed letter. I hope I didn't go broke on this bet. This will ruin my whole day. Not only my today was spoiled, but also many future days. Dear Amanda, I hope this letter finds you in good health and good spirits. I recently realized and accepted my addiction to alcohol. With the help of my higher power and sponsor, I am working through the program. I have now been clean and sober for 90 days. As part of the 12-step program, I have made a list of everyone I have harmed and am trying to make amends to them. In your case, I'm more than willing to try to fix the situation directly, but I don't know how. Only now, with the acquisition of sobriety, have I begun to regret our actions. But I don't want to cause you emotional trauma or bring discord into your life. Although I feel like a coward, the best I can do is ask for your forgiveness and, if you want, promise to never contact you again. Do whatever you want with the content. I don't have the courage to destroy it, but at the same time, I feel like I don't have the will to resist the temptation to keep them that comes with memories. Always with warm wishes, Josh. What the hell? I said out loud, unwrapping the torn paperback envelope to look at the front. Now I saw that it was addressed to my wife, Amanda. Josh regrets their actions? What actions? The only Josh I knew was a neighbor who had moved away a long time ago. Josh was one of those losers who lived in his parents' basement. Drunk most of the time, he claimed to be in the photography business. Josh was ten years older than Amanda and me. We called him Slinky, good for nothing, but making him smile when he fell down the stairs. I remembered something about how, after his parents died, Josh was forced to leave the house, unable to pay property taxes or something like that. My thoughts were in such turmoil that only a second later, I noticed that I was still holding the small manila envelope in my hands. Throwing the padded envelope and letter aside, I opened the plump manila envelope. A stack of 8x13 photographs fell out of it. The first few photos showed Amanda, 10 years younger, in rather erotic poses. She was wearing a tight blouse and shorts. The outfits looked familiar. I turned the photos over and didn't see the date. I walked into my home office and grabbed a framed photo from the collection of family photos on my desk. It was a photo of Amanda sitting and our first son, who was less than a year old at the time of the photo. Amanda gave me this photo for Christmas. In the framed photo, Amanda was wearing the same outfit. Also, the lighting in the framed photo of my oldest son was almost the same as the photo I received in the mail today. I turned the framed photograph over and the date was nine years ago. Now I have a date that matches the photos. I looked through the photos. 
In a series of photos, Amanda went from half-dressed to topless and completely naked. As Amanda's clothes shrank, my blood pressure rose. In the last series of photos, Amanda was in different positions. She was having sex. I sat down on the chair at my desk. I felt unconscious, as if all the blood had drained from my head. How long has Amanda been cheating on me behind my back? I thought out loud. I glanced at the assortment of photographs of my family on the table and tried to see if there was any imprint of Josh on them. The whole set showed the evolution of my family. Amanda on our wedding day. Amanda with my oldest son as a baby. Amanda with both of our boys as they grew up. Except for the first one, all the other photos had logos of various photo stores. Suddenly a terrible thought came into my head. What if the boys are not mine? I grabbed the most recent photo of my loving wife and two boys. They were dressed in summer league baseball uniforms. I felt the rush of pride that any father feels when looking at his offspring, but I tried to look at them more critically. Both boys resembled their mother Amanda in appearance, but they seemed to have my build and jawline. I leaned back in my chair and felt tired. It did not help. Then a thought flashed through my mind, causing me to rummage through my desk drawers. I pulled out a copy of the medical form my sons filled out to play baseball this season. In my day, paperwork was mostly about who to contact in case of an accident. The form was now almost six pages long, covering food allergies, insurance companies, waivers, medications, and consent. Even the treaty ending World War II fit on one sheet of paper. Somehow, I had a hard time believing that my child's baseball league was more important than ending World War II. It took some time, but I found the data on the voluminous form I was looking for, the blood types filled out by our doctor. Reaching into my wallet, I pulled out my Red Cross blood donor card. The card read, Group O. Amanda had the same blood type. We always joked that we were comfortable donating blood for each other. My eldest son's questionnaire indicated that he also had Group O, and I felt a huge sense of relief. I carefully looked through the younger boy's profile to find information about his blood type. It was written in bold black letters, blood type, a positive. Without being a doctor, even a first-year high school biology student knows that two people with blood type O cannot produce offspring with blood type A. I thought my world couldn't collapse twice in one hour, but it did. I stared at the printed letters, A is positive, for almost a full minute willing the letters to change, but they didn't change. Wild thoughts rushed through my head. I will kill Amanda. No, I'll leave Amanda. No, I'll kill you first, and then I'll leave you. No, I'll just take the boys and leave Amanda. The boys were nine and 11 years old. I was sure that if they were asked for a divorce, they would choose dear old dad, or not, or will they have a choice? These mental exercises lasted about an hour and simply exhausted me. I didn't find any solutions, just more and more questions. It got to the point where I was so tired that it took a huge effort for me to walk up the stairs and fall into bed. The next morning, I sat at the kitchen table and watched my wife's back as she did something in the sink. Last night, when she and the boys returned from the cinema, I asked to leave dinner. After a restless night's sleep, I felt a strange calm almost numbness. Everything in the house was the same. Amanda had not changed during the night, but it was as if someone showed me all the tricks of the illusionists. I was no longer in awe and questioned her every move and motive. Amanda, do you remember Josh? I asked. I couldn't see Amanda's face, but I swear her body tensed for a moment before answering. Josh? Our old neighbor Josh? Wow, I haven't heard that name in about a dozen years. Amanda said. I was just thinking about Josh and his photography stuff. He was always running around taking pictures of the neighbor's children. Don't you think he was a pedophile or something? Amanda sounded relieved as she replied with a grin. Believe me, Mark, Josh was not into little kids. And how do you know this, Amanda? I hesitated. Amanda wiped her hands on a dish rag before calling the boys over for breakfast. Quite often in the morning, I would see a hungover Josh trying to get some bimbos out of their basement without their parents finding them. You seem to know Josh well, Amanda? 
I asked. Do you miss him? Well, no, not really, Amanda began. We got much better conditions when Katie moved in with us. You know, our children are almost inseparable. Kat, our good neighbor, bought out the mortgage on the house after Josh's bank foreclosed on the apartment. Katie is a single mother. To buy Josh's house, she used life insurance money from the death of her police officer husband. Our children were the same age and soon became friends and were always together. As a single mother, Katie worked long hours and we essentially adopted her children. It was just as easy to load two kids into the car for a baseball game or to the beach as it was to load four. They kept each other busy. Amanda often joked with Katie that we would claim her children as dependents on our tax returns. As a single mother, Katie couldn't drive a nail into a snowdrift, so Amanda sent me to her as her husband for an hour. I wasn't ready to be on the TV show This Old House, but I could do most basic home renovations. My father was a true master in his field, but more often than not, his mantra was, if something can't be fixed with a hammer, you have an electrical problem. I didn't mind spending time doing some chores around Katie's house. She was easygoing, but Katie never gave me any hints about it, and I didn't show any interest in her. My father taught us to be people of our word, and I kept my oath. Amanda walked over and playfully tapped me on the shoulder. Mark, don't tell me that after all these years you're jealous of me for Josh. The thief's hat is on fire, Amanda. Do I have a reason to be jealous? Amanda sat down at the table but didn't meet my gaze, instead just stirring her coffee. Of course not, she said. Josh was just a harmless drunk. He always took pictures of everything. He probably could have become a good photographer if he hadn't been drinking all the time. I leaned back in my chair and said nothing. Amanda looked up from her coffee mug for a second before continuing. Come on, Mark. We were all just getting started. You worked two jobs and went to school, and I stayed at home all day with the child. After ten hours of Barney and diapers, I was desperate for adult conversation. Everyone in the area was working. Josh was just... just there. I still didn't say anything. Now Amanda seemed upset. My God, Mark, what? You think I had sex with some middle-aged drunk in between baby naps? Calm down. I put down my coffee cup. Amanda, you are acting terribly alarming. The best defense is a good attack. Don't you want to say me something? Amanda just looked at me angrily and jumped up from the table. We were interrupted by the boys noisily intruding into the kitchen. I silently rose from the table. As I walked up the stairs, I mentally threw reconciliation out the window. I knew that the anger I felt towards Amanda would pass, but the trust would never return. Mark, are you sure you want to do this? My brother Eric asked the next day. We were in his office and he was looking through the photographs, letter, and other papers that I had brought him. Eric was my half-brother from another mother. Eric's parents fled Eastern Europe during the Cold War and lived near us when I was growing up. Eric's parents died in a tragic accident when we were both just six years old. The social worker asked my parents to watch Eric for a few days while they tried to find other family members or foster parents. Eric's case fell through the cracks or was simply lost in the bureaucracy because the social workers never returned. Eric just stayed with us. I didn't know anything else then. I treated Eric's arrival in our family as a long overnight stay. I realize now that this was a financial burden for our working class family. When I asked my mother years later how she managed it, my mother simply shrugged it off. Slice the bread thinner, add more water to the soup. My father never turned away those in need. Although father was a religious man, he believed that faith was a matter of actions, not litanies, and had no connection with most organized religions. He always ended all our prayers at dinner with the words, Next time let there be more at the table, not less, and Lord, protect us from your followers. Dad never treated Eric any differently than he treated me and my brothers, which, given his temper, could be a good thing or a bad thing. Before he died, I asked my father why he accepted another mouth to feed him when he was already struggling. He just shrugged and said, This is what a man does. Eric was so light-skinned that he seemed almost snow white, reflecting his Eastern European heritage, but I was much darker skinned, 
given my parents' Southern Italian heritage. So when we introduced ourselves as brothers, it was always a bit of a puzzle. One day, when my father was with Eric at a father-son event, someone commented that my mother must have a very fair complexion. My father replied, yes, it's actually translucent. Eric graduated from law school, finishing at the top of his class. Recruited to a well-known law firm, Eric climbed the corporate ladder and became a partner. Even though he worked more than 80 hours a week to achieve this, Eric had all the trappings of an up-and-coming lawyer, an expensive car, an apartment with a view of the city, a model-looking bride from a wealthy family. She was with him at all the big special events. That is, until Eric burst into the office of his mentor, one of the senior partners, to surprise him with the news that he had signed a contract with a major client. However, Eric received a surprise when he found his bride in the same office, not in the most respectable form. Eric stayed with the firm until the end of the year to receive his bonuses and benefits. Then, cashing out, he led the exodus of both top lawyers and major clients. His old firm never recovered, although it survived for several more years before going completely bankrupt. Eric now had a small legal practice dealing with contracts, wills, and other matters. He made the lion's share of his money as a hitman, serving as outside counsel in various major lawsuits. He's married now and has two children of his own, but we're still close. Eric looked through my documents in the folder. Mark, I think you're still in shock. Take a little time to come to your senses. That is, how did you do it? I asked sarcastically. You are my personal hero because of how you handled that event at your first law firm. Not all of us can be heroes, Eric answered, trying to lighten the mood a little with humor. Someone should sit on the side of the road and applaud when we pass by. Then he became serious. Listen, Mark, your wife Amanda is a person, and most people have a hard time looking beyond themselves. We only see how we are treated and do not consider the consequences of our actions on others. Are you fucking Yoda now, Eric? I rolled my eyes. I want to leave. My revenge will be that this cheating bitch won't get a penny and everyone will know what she did. I don't want Amanda to think she can cheat on me and cite hormonal amnesia as if I'm some damn fool. Okay, Mark, but you know that revenge is a surefire way to let someone know that they got you. Knowing that someone can break you gives a person great power. Don't give that kind of power to anyone. It is better to ignore the emotional abuser. I know it doesn't bring instant gratification, but in the long run, it's the best thing to do. Take it from someone who has been there himself. Eric turned to tap on his computer keyboard. I don't practice family law, but my buddy from the old firm is a real shark. This guy takes no prisoners. Are you sure you want to do this? Call him, Eric. A week later, we were in an upscale corner office downtown, Mr. Big Shot having just finished going through the stack of papers I had brought. Tax returns, payrolls, mortgage payments, paternity tests, wills, etc., the list of what he needed seemed endless. Mr. Big Shot took off his reading glasses before speaking. Forget about it. I was shocked to hear these words from the mouth of an overweight lawyer who was supposed to be a kind of killer shark. Mark, I know that you and Eric are somehow connected, so I'll tell you straight. Forget about it. It took me a moment to speak. You mean I have to act like this never happened? Smile, knowing that I was deceived. Mr. Big Shot leaned back in his chair. Yes, unless you have video footage of your wife Amanda force-feeding your children Red Bull as babies and forcing them to fight each other for prize money. He pointed his finger at me. Currently, you have a nice wife, a house, and two good children. But if you work a little more, you may be left with a small apartment, no money, children working part-time, and your wife may make new male friends, and you will pay. I mean alimony, child support, more than half of my earnings and savings. I was stunned. Amanda has a job. And why should I pay child support for a child that's not even mine? Mr. Big Shot looked surprised. Mark, I'll take your money if you want to continue, but let me lay out the facts and the law. 
what your wife earns at this pathetic part-time hair salon does not compare to your income. So alimony is a given. The dispute is only about how much and for how long. When it comes to child support for a child who is not yours, only six states in America allow male parents to stop or not pay child support for a child who is not theirs and born while the couple was married. Unfortunately, we live in neither of these states. But what? What if I find out that Amanda knew all along that this was not my son? Is this a scam? Mr. Big Shot leaned forward, resting his forearms on the massive table. I'm going to tell you a dirty little secret. Let's say we can prove that your wife knew it was not your child. It would be fraudulent if she presented the child as yours. However, this type of fraud is the only one that does not entail any punishment and does not require compensation for damage. Heck, even if you were divorced and paying alimony for 17 years, your wife could announce to the world, full page in the New York Times, that you are not the father, and she knew it all along. And guess what? There is no law in all 50 states that requires her to pay you back or face any penalty. Mark, some poor bastard in Florida was paying alimony to a lady he wasn't even married to. This fool eventually took a DNA test that showed the child was not his, but the court ordered him to continue paying child support because it was, quote, in the best interest of the child. I think this case is now moving through the courts. The child will be 18 years old before this saga is over. But even if he wins, the pseudo-father will never get back a drop of the money he spent. I interrupted him. Can I at least try to get the money back from my cheating wife's boyfriend? In most states, only the mother can seek compensation. Only two states allow you, as a man, to try to get your money back. But you must prove that both the boyfriend and the mother knew about the deception. In addition, you must prove that there was an undue hardship on the child's well-being and the family's quality of life. And Mark, you know what? Our state is not one of those with such a law. I sat back in my chair as he continued. Ask yourself if a man's pride is worth more than half his property, spousal support, and child support. Money will not restore his self-respect or restore his reputation. Wouldn't it be better to end everything and take a chance to find someone who would be truly appreciated rather than suffer through a sham marriage? Eric spoke here. Maybe a marriage counselor can help them overcome this. Mr. Big Shot just waved his hand. At best, consultation helps in less than 10% of cases. In my experience, this only encourages spouses and allows them to prepare an escape strategy. More than two-thirds of women who undergo counseling initiate divorce. More than 55% of women who cheat end up leaving their marriage. Custody split states have a little less, but we don't live in one of those states. In our process, it's winner take all. Here the advantage is in favor of the mother. How old are you? 35 years old? Yes, I muttered, trying to take all these blows. Mark, I hate to give bad news, but most often a wife cheats on her husband at the age of 45. If your wife has already had an affair, then she turns 40. The likelihood that she will have a relapse is quite high unfortunately, almost certain. The pain and guilt from the previous affair or affair have subsided, but the memories of what was exciting, good, exciting, whatever it was, about that event will grow in the mind. It's like a high school athlete scoring the winning point but breaking his leg in the process. The mind downplays or forgets the pain, but at the same time inflates the important moment beyond recognition. The desire to relive this moment can turn into an obsession. But while a middle-aged athlete can, at best, relive those glory days only through their children's athletic competitions, spouses can and will seek a partner outside of marriage in an attempt to recapture what made them have an affair in the first place. Eric picked up what I was thinking. Once she cheats, she won't stop. Mr. Big Shot spread his arms out to the sides, palms up. Nothing is absolute. But infidelity comes in second place after the main reason for divorce, money. I swear this won't happen to me, I said through clenched teeth. Swear as much as you want, Mark, Mr. Big replied. Swearing is a compromise between flight and fight. Crap, 
I said under my breath. Isn't it cheaper to keep her? Mr. Big asked, philosophically. Extramarital affairs are a problem that 68% of all married people face during marriage. You have kids and that changes the whole dynamic. Children after divorce are much more likely to abuse illegal substances, be promiscuous, and suffer from depression and anger. Heck, the only truth about divorce is that there are no real winners. However, in all cases, the biggest losers are the children. Suddenly I remembered the day I told my father that we were expecting a baby. Mark, said the father, many men become fathers, but fewer and fewer fathers become men. To be a man who is also a father, your first, last, and only priority should be your children. If there is not enough food, you starve. If you don't have enough shelter, you endure the cold. If you don't have enough money, you go without it. The most important thing is strength. You have to be strong at all times for the sake of your family, and I'm not talking about some inflatable show that deflates when the going gets tough. You must not only demonstrate strength, but also be strong enough to seek and accept help when it is needed. You will never know how strong you are until strength is all you have. Son, you will often make mistakes, but you should never doubt. This is expected and accepted from a true man. Your efforts will rarely be appreciated or recognized. Most often they will be ridiculed, but a real true man does not do this for the sake of praise. He does it for the sake of his family, for the sake of his children, because he is a real and true man. I jumped out of my chair as if I had been shot and extended my hand to Mr. Big Shot. Thank you for your time. I certainly got a damn good legal education, but I don't think I'll use your services right now. What do I owe you for my efforts? Mr. Big grinned, leaning forward to shake my hand. No fee, Mark. It was just a conversation between a couple of old lawyer friends. He turned to my brother Eric. Besides, I owe your brother a big debt of gratitude for getting my fat ass out of a jam at the old firm. Things are going much better for me now, and I have him to thank for that. Just call me anytime. My door is always open for you. I'm serious. We were driving back in Eric's car when I asked, Eric, after you caught your fiancé with your mentor, why didn't you quit right away? Why did you work for that company for almost a year? I saw Eric's jaw tense before he spoke. Naturally, my first reaction was to quit immediately. He smiled slightly. Well, actually, that was my second reaction. My first reaction was to headbutt the old bastard after I pulled him away from that bitch. Eric paused to tune the radio to another station. After I left his fat ass sprawled out on the carpet, I went to my office and printed out my resignation letter. So why didn't you submit it? I was angry as hell, Mark. Then I felt sorry for myself. Then I remembered that our dad always talked about pity. Anyway, I decided why should I let these two rob me of the fruits of my sweat and labor? The next day, for the first time ever, the most senior partner came to see me. He was concerned about the misunderstanding between me and my old mentor. What nonsense. It's just that I had great connections in high places, and this idiot was just worried about me leaving and taking all these clients and all the billable hours with me. He promised me all sorts of magic beans, and I made him put it all in writing. From then on, I didn't let anyone dictate my happiness. I even kept this bitch to myself for a few good sessions. Why not? Both of us were not virgins and it cannot be said that we were never together. Once I found something better, she immediately became history. The same thing with the law firm, the day my contract ended, it also became history. I took my brother's words to heart. From that day on, I did what brought me happiness, staying true to my father's position that children come first. Amanda became a nobody to me. I was determined to have as little to do with her as possible. Things got easier a week after I returned from my meeting with Mr. Big Shot. Mark, I have great news, Amanda announced at dinner. The salon wants to make me a full-time manager. For starters, I'll have to work evenings and weekends. But I'm sure that for a while, you and the boys will be able to cook your own dinners. This worked out perfectly as I left for work before Amanda woke up. And by the time I got home, she was already in her position as salon manager. By the time she closed the store, I was already fast asleep. On her days off, I told Amanda I played darts. 
In fact, I decided to have several meetings with a psychoanalyst on my own. I discovered that I was no more spoiled than the next guy. But more importantly, I discovered that in addition to my obligations to my children, I was responsible for my own satisfaction. What Amanda did, is doing, or is going to do, was beyond my control. We are surrounded by temptations. It is our personal weakness and responsibility when we give in to these temptations. The truth is, when I stopped trusting Amanda, it changed the feelings I once had for her. I soon found that I no longer cared what she did. Over time, the hatred for her actions lost its original intensity, but the bad feelings remained. I do this for my children, period, end of story. Amanda became more like the girl next door with benefits. She was so engrossed in her work that I don't think she even noticed it. Meanwhile, the boys and I were having a great time. I took out a huge home equity loan, built a pool, an outdoor deck, and turned our basement into a veritable man cave. Got rid of my boring car and bought a massive SUV with crap gas mileage. My boys and Katie's children traveled in comfort as I purchased season tickets to all sporting events. I became the driver of the children's team, since the whole team plus equipment could squeeze into this damn SUV. Every win or loss resulted in a trip to the local pizzeria or ice cream parlor at my expense. Katie often accompanied us on our trips. People often mistook us for one big family. I would like to, I answered, half-jokingly. This always earned Katie a puzzled look. Amanda constantly made excuses, citing her work schedule, being too tired, or wanting to relax on her day off. Soon, the boys simply stopped asking her. A few years later, my eldest boy and Katie's firstborn were admitted to the same college, mine on a partial scholarship. Katie never found out that I paid for the rest myself, as well as the expenses for my boy. Three years later, the same scene was repeated with the last of our offspring. This brings us to today and my current dilemma. Stay or go? Move on or maintain the status quo? Amanda sat on our outdoor deck enjoying the last days of summer, overlooking the pool, glass of wine in hand. I returned after clearing the SUV of the remains of our trip. As I took my place on the lounge chair opposite her, Amanda closed her eyes. Mark, now that the boys have left, the house seems so empty. Amanda drank a little more wine. What difference does it make? But I'm ready for change. I had already finally made my decision and thought, wait, dear, you will have such changes. I threw the papers on the glass table between us. Amanda, I don't think we should be together. I would like a divorce. Amanda rose from her chair and grabbed the papers, quickly scanning them. What kind of nonsense is this, Mark? Amanda, this is just a copy of the divorce petition. As soon as you find a lawyer, I will ask mine to send him the official papers. As you can see, I'm quite fair. The savings are... Are you crazy? Amanda almost screamed. After two decades, you are leaving me? Now, after everything we've been through? She continued looking through the papers. No, alimony? Where is the savings section? Total household debt? What are you trying to do? I tried to be calm. We both make about the same amount and have about the same amount in our retirement accounts. This was true, as I deferred all salary increases that came with my recent string of raises, plus kept my 401k contributions to a minimum after withdrawing it to pay for college for my sons. Amanda looked like she'd been hit with an axe as she continued to scroll through the petition. We get the same salary only because I work twice as many hours as you. I won't sell my house. I work too hard on it. Amanda, we are in the red on the house after you calculated the loan to buy a house. Where do you think the money came from for this veranda, your new kitchen for... She threw the papers on the table. We will not get divorced and this is final. Suddenly it was like a light bulb went off in her head. You are a son of a bitch. Amanda hissed pointing her finger at me. Found someone else? I gave you the best years of my life, and now you want to leave me for some young girl? Her face turned red. How long have you been cheating on me? You are a pig. Please, I sighed. Let's not talk about this. It doesn't matter what the reason is. 
We are a no-fault state. Everything, both assets and debts, will be divided equally. However, Amanda did not calm down. You're wrong, mister. It matters. I want to know and I deserve to know. Who did you cheat on me with? I shook my head and said softly, It's true that there were cases of infidelity, but please let's not talk about it. It's better if we just leave it. My vision blurred for a moment as Amanda threw her glass of wine in my face. As I stood up to go into the kitchen, I felt a wine glass bounce off my back and break on the floor of the veranda. Amanda was furious and followed me, continuing her tirade while I washed my face in the kitchen sink. You are a son of a bitch. I'm not going to get thrown out because you want to have fun with some girl. No wonder our sex life has been hell these past few years. Well, let me tell you something, buddy. I've had many opportunities in the past, but I never... Amanda froze as I turned and placed photographs of her and Josh in a variety of poses, one after another, on the kitchen table. I spanked with photographs, each of them more revealing than the previous one. Her face white, Amanda rushed to the kitchen sink. I shuffled the photos into a pile and sat down at the kitchen table. Well, Amanda, it looks like you've taken advantage of the opportunities you've been given in the past. She rinsed her mouth with tap water and splashed it on her face. Finally, she wiped her face dry with a towel and sat down on the chair opposite me. Please, Mark, take it away. Amanda pushed the stack of photographs towards me with one finger, as if it were a live, poisonous snake. I folded the photos into an envelope and then threw them into the dresser drawer behind me. Amanda buried her head in her hands. Oh my God, I don't know what to say. I was tired. It doesn't matter, Amanda. I don't care. Amanda grabbed my hand. Mark, please listen. It was only one time. You have to believe me. No, Amanda, I shouldn't believe you, and I don't believe it. I leaned back in my chair. Yes, and in what way? That you would never lie about cheating. Amanda clutched my hand tighter. It was so long ago. I didn't know being a mother was so hard. I didn't get enough sleep fussing with the child, and you were always tired after work. I felt like I was losing my identity, like I was just another mom or your wife. I pulled my hand back. I worked two jobs and went to college, all for us, our family, so I really don't want to hear about being tired. Mark, I know, Amanda begged. I would like to return everything back. Josh was just a fun drunk. Sometimes Josh's mom would come over for a few minutes to watch the baby. Give me a chance to be with the grown-up for a little while to keep my sanity. I tried to get up. Amanda, I really don't care. She ignored me and continued. Josh always had a drink of alcohol in his hand. After a while, I would take a sip or two. He always took pictures of me with a camera with a high shutter speed. I started fooling around, pretending it was some kind of big modeling shoot. Josh constantly encouraged me, saying how great I looked, how natural I looked, how much the camera loved me. Amanda bit her lip as she looked at me. It was just fun that got out of control. I would pull my blouse down to expose my shoulder, or lift it up a little to show my belly button. Pretty soon I felt so comfortable that I went all the way down to my bra. There was nothing special about it. People see more on the beach. I saw that Amanda had tears in her eyes. One day, when I started talking about taking a photo of you for Christmas, Josh offered to do it for free. Everything went very well. The photo turned out great. Immediately after, our son fell asleep on the couch in Josh's studio. You mean, his parents' basement, Amanda? She wiped a tear from her eye. I thought he'd be sleeping for a while and didn't want to wake him up, so Josh and I had a drink. Well, one drink led to a bottle and, well, with your crazy schedule, you and I haven't had sex in a long time. I was feeling very excited when Josh started taking pictures of me and this time my bad girl came out. He made me feel so sexy, I felt so naughty winking at Josh, and he kept encouraging it as if we were doing a real photo shoot. I thought I couldn't be more shocked after seeing the photos, but I was. Are you saying that you had sex with that damn drunk while my son was sleeping a few meters away from you? I started to stutter. Oh God, Mark, I'm so ashamed. I don't know what came over me. I was so, so... Amanda paused. 
She dropped her heat on the table and began to sob. Amanda, we cannot change the past. We just have to admit our actions. Please sign the papers. We will tell people that we have moved away from each other. No one outside our little family will know anything. Amanda lifted her tear-streaked face from the table. It doesn't have to be this way, Mark. Please, it was so long ago. It was such a minor event, a simple blip, a stupid mistake with no consequences. I pulled out another set of documents from the folder, placed them in front of Amanda, and spoke while she looked through the documents. Amanda, all actions have consequences, some more than others. Mark, what is this? Amanda asked, looking from page to page at the graphs and charts. Amanda, these are the results of our family's DNA test as well as our blood type. You see, that one is not suitable for us. Amanda clutched her chest and began to choke. I stood up and took a paper bag out of the kitchen cabinet. Amanda, breathe into this paper bag, I ordered, placing the bag in her hands. You're hyperventilating. Now slow down. Take natural breaths. Breathe through your nose. Easier. Easier. After a minute, Amanda's breathing returned to normal. I stepped back to sit on my side of the kitchen table. She put down the paper bag as the color returned to her face. Amanda, you knew all along. It was a statement, not a question. Amanda began shaking her heed while twirling the paper bag in her hands. I, I, I suspected, but I just hoped that, well, I prayed, but I was never, I was never sure. She stopped mid-sentence. Amanda, come on, I persuaded. You graduated from college with honors in biology, if I remember. You must have thought me a fool when I swallowed all this nonsense about preterm birth, when a baby was born prematurely. I shook my head. Now you understand why it's hard for me to believe your words when you not only cheated, but also forced me to raise someone else's child. It wasn't like that, Mark. After Josh and I... I was so ashamed. I didn't want anyone to touch me, not even you. I vowed that I would become the best mother and wife in the world. And when I found out that I was pregnant, I... I just panicked. I had nightmares that you would kick me out, take our son, force me to have an abortion. Amanda, when we were together, did I ever threaten you? Forced you to do things you didn't want to? You know how family-oriented I am, how I was raised? I stopped to rub my temples. If you came to me, we could work things out. However, you chose to lie. It was just one lie, Mark. No, Amanda, there was more than one lie. It was a lie every day until today. Every day you chose to live by telling lies. I had no choice, Amanda pleaded. You always had a choice, Amanda. You could come to me at any time. You chose to continue this lie, and I don't know how many others. Now it's my choice. Please, Mark, Amanda begged. Don't tell the boys. Amanda, the time for lying is over. Children who experience secrecy and lies cannot trust what they are told and become insecure and dependent. When the family structure finally collapses, there may be no honest relationships left to fall back on. The kids feel stranded, so either you tell them or I will. My God, said Amanda. What will I tell them? Boys? Your mother is a cheap, lying, ungrateful slut who cheated on your father. Now I had to smile. Amanda, you can skip the cheap, lying, ungrateful slut part. How about we tell the boys that their mother made a mistake, but they are both still our sons and it doesn't change anything about our love for them. The boys took it pretty well, I think considering that all their friends have stepfathers, stepmothers, two moms or two dads and blended families. This was not a big problem for them. Amanda was a little bitter about all this. She kept saying that we could work things out, that not enjoying the house we had worked so hard on was a waste of time, but I was just done with it all and wanted to move on. Oddly enough, the house turned out to be more troublesome than the divorce. Our megabank gave us a break when we tried to return it to them. They killed all the short sales we had planned, and we never talked to the same person twice. Depending on who they talked to at Megabank, they received different answers to the same questions. Plus, the paperwork was unrealistic. I think we have personally cut down most of the trees in Washington State just by our written requests. Thank God my brother Eric 
asked one of his buddies who was a real legal eagle in real estate and law to help us. Over the course of several months, he proved that Mega Bank violated not only its own internal policies, but also many state and federal laws enacted to protect homeowners caught in upside-down mortgages. By a strange coincidence, Mega Bank ended up owing us money. When they did not even show up for the court hearing, despite four certified letters, we received a default judgment, according to which the house was provided to us free of charge, plus court and lawyer costs were borne by the bank. It turned into a circus with a simultaneous show in all three arenas, when our lawyer showed up at the Mega Bank branch with two armed sheriffs, a court order and a moving company to confiscate their property, furniture, computer equipment, etc., when Mega Bank ignored countless attorney fee notices. Local media were out in full force, and even bystanders helped dismantle the bank's lights while a shocked bank manager tried to get his phone calls answered by someone higher up. The megabank manager was using his personal mobile phone because his work phone had been confiscated. When the story of David defeats Goliath became known throughout the country, our lawyer and I became celebrities for a while. I don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth, but the addition to the house contributed to the settlement of our divorce. Amanda didn't want to sell the house right now, so after a lot of debate, she agreed to pay me half the rent and she would pay for gas electricity, water, etc. We will pay 50-50 for insurance and taxes, and proceeds from future sales will be split equally. I did what every recently divorced middle-aged man does and rented a terrible apartment for a short period of time while I decided what to do with my life. Naturally, I joined the gym to try to get back in shape. I hate going to the gym. And now I was standing at the reception, looking forward to a free lesson with a personal trainer when I heard, Mark! Oh God, how glad I am to see you. I turned around and saw my old neighbor, Katie. She looked great. Katie wore a tight leotard with the gym's name on the front and back. She hugged me. Damn, she was tight everywhere. Katie, you look great, I said, as she released me from the hug. What are you doing here? I work here, Mark. Well, at least part of the time. Katie looked down at the clipboard she had with her. It also looks like I'm your personal trainer tonight. Which machine do you want to start with? Um, what about trading? I suggested. I'll buy you a chocolate of your choice. Katie laughed and dragged me towards an array of devices that might have been found in a medieval dungeon for extracting confessions. I didn't see any of those exercise machines that I remembered from my school physical education lessons. I tried not to appear weak, but after 90 minutes... I threw up twice. Like any pseudo-macho man, I lied and explained my urge to go to the toilet by drinking too much coffee in the office. The scales there must have been metric because I know pounds were never that heavy. Katie took pity on me and agreed to meet me in a cafe after I limped to the locker room. She looked fresh and radiant, holding my arm as we stood in line at a local cafe while I felt like the walking dead. Katie. Since when did coffee become so complicated? I said after she told the guy taking our order what sounded like the makings of a scientific chemistry experiment. If I remember, there are only three types of coffee. Small, medium, and large. Katie laughed. She had a high, musical voice that I remembered well. Mark, just tell the barista what you like and he can make you something. Barista? My God. I shook my head in amazement. Okay, please give me something a straight man could drink at a football game without getting his ass kicked. Katie patted me on the shoulder as we walked to the table. Mark, I really missed you. Damn, Katie. You just missed someone who does repairs at your house for free. Katie blew on the mixed story that was her coffee before and swearing. Well, that too. I feel sorry for you and Amanda. She sipped at her drink. It's hard to believe that woman cheated on you. I had to close my mouth to keep from choking on my coffee. What? Who? How? How do you know? Katie looked at me for a second before lowering her cup and speaking. Nobody told me. I've known you and Amanda for a long time. She shrugged. I can't prove anything. Just the intuition of an old cop's wife. Amanda always had that, 
I hope I don't get caught. Look what I got away with. Look. I thought about what Katie said. So, Amanda never told you anything? Katie shrugged again. No, Mark. I didn't tell you. Would it help you to get back together with her if she told you? Well, you know, if you knew more details. I shook my head. No. It's not about treason. Well, that is, yes, it's about treason. But more because of lies and mistrust. I can't get over this. I have as much chance of gaining trust in Amanda as a blind man with a microscope. And without trust, I moved my fingers. Why bother? The marriage is over. I tried to lighten the mood and made Katie laugh by talking about our confrontation, as well as the unusual division of the house between me and Amanda. I was actually enjoying myself and time seemed to fly by while we were both having fun. Suddenly, Katie looked at her watch. Sorry, Mark, but I have to go. The last bus leaves in a few minutes. Don't worry, Katie. I'll give you a ride home. Thank you very much, otherwise my car won't start. Bad starter, I think, and work has cut my hours. Things are a little tight, so I have to wait until my next paycheck to get the car towed to the shop and fixed. Now I looked at my watch. Screw this, Katie, why didn't you call me sooner? I'll pick up a starter and put it in your car. If we leave now, we can get to the auto parts store before it closes. That would be great, Mark. For the last month, I have had to leave home three hours earlier to catch all the buses. And the nearest stop is a 30-minute walk. Then Katie paused. But I, um, now I don't have money. I waved it off. Forget about it. You need a car. We'll deal with debt repayment when you get out of stagnation. Besides, all my tools and things are still in my, that is, Amanda's garage. I haven't had time to transport them yet. Standing up. I extended my hand to her. Come on, beautiful lady. The Prius hybrid chariot is waiting for you. Katie gave me a puzzled look. Hybrid Prius? What happened to that monstrous macho manly SUV of yours? He darkened her. Yes, I'm tired of driving from gas station to gas station. I think my carbon footprint was killing half a hectare of rainforest every day. Everyone kept looking at me like I was some kind of eco-terrorist. Katie looked at me in amazement. I just can't imagine you in a hybrid. Yes, I myself can almost feel my testosterone levels dropping when I squeeze myself into this plastic candy. You know how it is with us guys? Size matters. She giggled as I opened the car door for her. We were lucky the auto shop had a starter that fit Katie's car, and bonus, it was on sale. Amanda wasn't home, but I still had the code to the garage door, so... With the right tools, an hour and a half later, I started Katie's car. Katie was so excited that she hugged me tightly and kissed me right on the lips. I didn't return the hug, holding the lubricated tool in my hands. While washing my hands, I discovered that the waiter tap did not open completely and the drainage was slow. Drying my hands, I pointed to the sink. Katie, why didn't you call me? I could take care of that. Mark... I knew you and Amanda had bigger problems. I didn't want to bother you over nothing. Besides, when the job cut started, I couldn't afford... She turned away, but not before I saw tears in her ease. I am not a case of charity. I walked up and put my arm around her shoulders. This is not charity. Just one neighbor helping another. I squeezed her hand. Besides, I have a lot of free time right now, and you seem to have things to do to fill that time. Tell you what, let's make a list and, like Kris Kringle, check it twice. Now be so kind as to bring me a pen and paper, please. Katie wiped her eyes but smiled weakly as she turned to me. Okay, Santa, but if you're too kind, I can't promise I won't become shameless. For the next two weeks, I seemed to spend all my free time at Katie's house. Her house didn't need anything major, just a lot of little things from repairing the screen door, rusty door hinges, to whitewashing the splash guard. I didn't get to see her shameless side, but I enjoyed our time together. One evening, after a few glasses of wine, Katia talked about her first husband. He was a good man, Mark. Always helped others. Died when a drunk driver hit him. But he wasn't even on duty. Stopped on the way home from the gym to help a woman who had a flat tire. The damn drunk didn't even slow down. She took another sip of her drink. 
But he was a fighter. Lasted for four days. Do you know what he told me last? I said nothing. Mark, the last words my husband said were not about him, but about the family. Tears were now streaming down her face. He said, Take care of our boys. Take care of them and yourself. I walked around the table to hug her and she continued. I never thought that everything would be like this. Since he was off duty, we did not receive any survivor benefits. His small life insurance policy helped us buy this house. Cops take care of their own, and his squad was always ready to help. But I had to move. Because, as wonderful as they were, it constantly reminded me of his death. I just never, I just never thought it would be this hard. I let Cadi cry, there were no words to say. The next morning I was lying under the bathroom sink fixing the drain. I felt someone tap on my leg. Mark, where did you go last evening? I heard Katia say. Back to my terrible little apartment, I answered, removing the drain trap. You were almost exhausted. That's why I put you to bed before leaving. I stuck my hand out from under the sink and showed Katie the drain trap. Damn, girl! Look at all that hair! Did you wash in a mongoose sink? Suddenly the front door slammed, and I heard footsteps, followed by a shrill voice. Where is he? What are you doing with my husband? Hitting my forehead, pulling my head out from under the sink, I saw Amanda's legs in the bathroom doorway. Leave him alone, Amanda yelled at Katie. I jumped up, finding myself between a shocked Katie and an angry Amanda. Amanda, what are you doing here? I asked, trying to defuse the situation. Amanda looked away from Katie and turned to me. Damn it, Mark. I know what's going on. Every night you leave this woman's house with your clothes all in disarray, sweaty like a farmer plowing a field. I know you did. Amanda paused. It seemed like she was trying to calm down. I understand that you are trying to get even with me, but you already had fun having fun with this bitch. It's time for us to be together again. I was so shocked that I could hardly speak. Amanda, we can't get back together. That time is long gone. Besides, Katie and I have nothing. I felt Katie's arms wrap around me from behind before she spoke. That's right, Amanda, there's nothing. But you know what? Now everything will change. My late husband, God rest his soul, told me to take care of myself. And I intend to start right now by taking your ex-husband upstairs. Now Amanda and I stood stunned. Katie came from behind me and took Amanda's hand, leading her through the open front door. Now please, even though you're not a stranger, call first. We'll be busy for a while. With that, Katie closed the door behind the still mute Amanda. Katie came back to me when I finally found my voice. Katie, that was something. Thanks for supporting me and boosting my ego, but it wasn't necessary. Katie stood right in front of me and took off her blouse. She wasn't wearing a bra, and even for her age, Katie's breasts were quite a sight. I managed to tear my eyes away from these two beauties and look into Katie's eyes, berating myself for what I was about to say. Are you sure you want this? Katie put her arms around my neck. Mark, I've known you longer than my husband. I loved him like no other, and I kept my promise to him to take care of our boys. Now she intends to fulfill her other promise to him and take care of herself. With these words, she took me by the hand and led me upstairs to the bedroom. I don't know who was more nervous. I didn't want to ruin everything and Katie hadn't been with a man in almost two decades. But, just like when riding a bicycle, we maintained our balance and found the right speed. The conversation in bed became interesting when Katie stated, Mark, you will move in with me. It was a statement, not a question. Wait. This is a bold statement. Aren't you afraid that this is just a waste? Katie propped herself up on one arm, giving me a view of those wonderful breasts. Mark, we have been friends for most of our lives. She raised her hand to stop me. We are too old to play games. It's a win-win. You need somewhere to live, but I have free space. I care about you. You care about me. I have needs, and so do you. Why should you pay rent to some faceless landlord? If it makes you feel better, you can save the money you spend on rent towards your mortgage. Besides, you know this house better than anyone else. Katie, wouldn't this be weird? I pointed across the street to my old house where Amanda lived. Katie shrugged silently. It's not my problem. 
I no longer care what others think. I only care what you think. Your old house is still in your name. This is a big investment, and what could be better than seeing it every day? That's what we did. Things were strange for a while. Amanda still felt bitter about the whole event. She seemed unable to move on. Damn it, Mark. Amanda told me one day when I was at her house, fixing a crack in the driveway. When are you going to come back home? It's crazy. You know you belong with me. What can I do? You know that I regret everything. Just tell me what needs to be done to make it go away. I peeled the sealant cover off before speaking. Amanda, I know you're sorry, and so am I. The point is, we're not getting back together. You need to move on with your life. Find someone else. Who, for example? Amanda snorted. I work in a salon with gay hairdressers. Most of my clients are ex-wives. She looked at the ground. I never thought that I would become one of them. I didn't say anything and started collecting my tools. Come on, Mark, Amanda begged. Of course, you can give me another chance. Just forgive and forget, at least for the sake of our boys. After all, the holidays are coming. We need to be together. Amanda, you are forgiven, and for over a decade, you had a chance every day that you chose not to take. As for forgetting, I shook my head. It's true, the holidays are coming. The boys will be back from school, and we can have alternating dinners at yours and Katie's with all the kids, like in the past. Amanda crossed her arms defiantly. I will not tolerate this in my house. Bitches! And I will never cross the threshold of her house. I just shrugged. I think we'll miss you. I thought the holidays would be awkward for the kids, what with their parents' new living arrangements and all. But the fears turned out to be unfounded, since both pairs of children took everything calmly. I guess that's good, but damn, doesn't their generation care? The boys attended two dinners each so as not to upset either mother. But by Christmas, the children had pressured Amanda enough to come over to Katie's house for a short visit. Katie begged her to stay, but to no avail. Katie tells me she has nothing against Amanda and doesn't mind me spending time there doing house renovations or activities with my boys and Amanda. I don't think they'll ever be friends like they used to be. But Amanda seems to have warmed up and has at least become politer to Katie over time. After a year of marriage, I couldn't be happier. This is not the delirium tremens of love of our youth, but a much deeper, mature love, full of affection and respect. However, I felt obligated and asked Katie about making it legal. Mark, Katie said, holding my head with both hands, you're a great guy and I want to spend the rest of our lives together. But I promised myself that I would only get married once in my life. I hope you understand. Truth be told, I never could. But I remembered one more thing that my father drilled into me. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Four, five. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.